if you would. I'm going to be here for the Christmas message today, and here's what we're going to do. I, you know, God laid it on my heart just to keep everything simple today, and and at the same time, I'm excited about what I get to share. Always, anytime I talk about Christmas and the birth of Christ and the reason for his coming, it's always a time of excitement. But what I want to do today, I want to look at one of the most popular verses uh, that is found in the scriptures, probably known by more people uh, than any other verse, and that's John 3.16. I'll just read it for you, and then, then we'll get to where we're going today. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, it was my desire to go back and to get all the context of this and to get the conversation that's going on so that you would get the verse into context. And then I started that, and I started to type that up, and then I realized that it wasn't all going to fit today. And so I didn't want to divide the Christmas message up into three weeks. So I came back and just looked at verse 16. But I do want to give you a little bit of the context without going into great deal, if I could. John 3.16 is set in the middle of a conversation between Jesus and a man by the name of Nicodemus. Jump back to chapter 3, verse 1. Watch this. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees, okay? He's a religious leader. It goes beyond that. Nicodemus would have been a man that sat on a Sanhedrin. He would have been the most religious man that you and I could ever begin to picture within our minds. Watch the verse again. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So he's, he's a part of the Sanhedrin. The same came to Jesus by night. He came possibly at night for maybe two different reasons. Maybe it, because... He had heard the miracles of, or he had witnessed the miracles of Christ according to John chapter 2, and, and he was curious and he wanted a conversation that wouldn't be interrupted. And so maybe that's why he came at night. That's one possible reason. Another one was, would be this that the possibility that he didn't want anybody else to know that he had an interest in what Jesus was teaching uh, because the religious leaders were against Jesus Christ. And so maybe that was the reason. Let me come back to verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And then Jesus, when he spoke to him, he never, he didn't get into any kind of small talk, but he cut right to the truth of the matter because you got to understand, he knew the heart of Nicodemus. He knew why Nicodemus had come to him because Nicodemus was under the, the exercising of the Spirit of God. And so in his heart, it's beginning to stir. And he's got an interest in what Jesus has been proclaiming. And then Jesus speaks the words of verse 3 that was a shock to the Jewish leaders. Watch verse 3. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I say that would have been a tremendous shock to the Jewish teachers and the leaders for this reason. They believed that because of their natural birth, because they were the descendants of Abraham, they believed that guaranteed them access and entry into heaven. They believed that. They believed because they were the descendants of, of Abraham that they far exceeded anybody else on earth and then Jesus throws this out and he says this except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God which would have just completely taken Nicodemus back and it did Nicodemus said this in verse 4 Nicodemus saith unto him how can a man be born when he's old can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born Jesus answered verily verily I say unto thee except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And I'd love to get into that verse, but we don't have time to. But I'm going to say this. There's a lot of difference of opinion as to what the water refers to there. Let me just give it, let me tell you what I believe it is, and I want to move on. Nicodemus would have been very aware of the ceremonial washings 
under the law because you got to realize this this it's they're still under the law right here he would have been very familiar with the ceremonial washings of the law but he was not familiar with the new birth of the spirit though he should have been jesus is saying this to him in this verse he's saying nicodemus if there is not a cleansing and nicodemus if there is not a supernatural work of the spirit of god in your life you cannot see you will not enter the kingdom of god jesus went on to explain some of that and then he came to verse 14 and he gave an illustration he said this and as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the son of man be lifted up he points back to the old testament to whenever the people were were bitten by the 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 serpents and Moses was commanded to make a, a serpent out of brass and to raise it up on a pole. And Jesus said this, just like the serpent was lifted up on the pole as a remedy for their sin back there, he says, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And then he goes on to explain that. And he wades on down, and then he comes to John three sixteen, which is kind of a light in the darkness. You know, I'm reminded back in verse uh verse two that that or verse uh verse one that nicodemus came to him uh at night i'll read verses one and two again there was a man of the pharisees named nicodemus a ruler of the jews the same came to jesus by night came in the darkness it, he is a picture nicodemus is a picture of every religious individual on the face of the earth every religious individual he sat on a Sanhedrin. He was a ruler of the, of the Jews. He knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand, but yet he was not saved. And so in the midst of the darkness that Nicodemus is in, John 3.16 is a light. It's a light. It's a light for you and I. And I want to point that out today. I want to point that out. But you can't grasp the light until you grasp the darkness. So here's what I got to do. I got to paint for you a picture this morning with words. I got to paint for you a picture of our spiritual condition. Apart from Jesus Christ, man's spiritual condition, apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ. What's it look like? And so that will make the dark background. And then we'll take this verse, verse 16, the light in the midst of the darkness, and we'll set it against that dark background. So I want you to go with me for a little bit. I'm going to walk you down a path, if I could, and I'm going to point you to the darkness, first of all, because you got to get this. You have to get this. The first point about the darkness is this. We are all sinners. And I put an exclamation point at the end because that is so important to understand there is not one individual in this room that sometime in their life has not sinned against God you have sinned against your fellow man you have sinned against other people in your life but ultimately you have sinned against God in Romans 3 23 we read these words for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God you see, every one of us are born into sin. Every single one of us, when you are born, you are born with a sin nature. You are not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you are a sinner. Because you are born with a sin nature, and nobody, but nobody has to teach you how to sin. Nobody. On Wednesday night, I think it was Wednesday night, we talked a little bit about that, and I shared with the people about my grandson, grandsons now, but my the oldest grandson the one I called jitterbug comes up with things that I, I said to his mom where does he get this because nobody's taught it to him but it's that it's that sin nature in that little guy the other the other night I, I got to share this story with you when Taylor we had met him this week and talked to him down in Mechanicsburg and Taylor was in the vehicle with them while we were going from where we where we grabbed a bite to eat and then we were going over to this shopping center and and Taylor was talking to her sister Katie and and Asher just 
said, excuse me. And that, his mom's taught him if he wants to get into a conversation that he's got to say, excuse me, if somebody's talking. So he says that. And he said to his mom, he said, I just want to throw a hockey puck at you. And she couldn't say, why do you want to throw a hockey puck at me, Asher? Because his mom was talking to Taylor. And he wanted to talk to Taylor. And so he wanted to throw a hockey puck. And I said, where does he come up with this stuff at, you know? To throw a hockey puck at his mom. But the whole point is this, that we're born into sin and, and we have this sin nature and we laugh about it sometimes, but ultimately it's extremely serious. Watch what Isaiah 53, 6a says. It says this, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Now listen, Adam sinned back in Genesis chapter 3, and he, after he sinned, the sin nature is passed down through his seed to every single one of us, and so all we like sheep have gone astray. If you've ever been around sheep, you know this. They'll always follow the lead sheep. They'll go, and it doesn't matter if that sheep runs out and he runs off the edge of a cliff, all the other sheep are going to follow him because they're followers. And so we're no different. All we like sheep have gone astray. We, we have turned everyone to his own way. We have followed after Adam, and we too disobey God. We disobey the word of God, and so we are all guilty of sin. Watch what Paul wrote in Romans about every one of us. He says this, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They, they are all going out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, and with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You say, wow, that's pretty harsh. That describes man. That describes every single one of us. We're, we are all guilty of sin. Every single one of us. So you hold on to that. You say, well, it, that's not really a big deal because it's kind of a universal problem. It is a universal problem, but it's also a personal problem. I'm going to show you why. brings me to point number two. And we're building up to 316, by the way. Point number two, our sin separates us from God, exclamation point. Because of the sin that is within our lives, there is a barrier between us and God. Watch what... Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 59, 2 and 3. It says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue hath muttered perverseness. There is a separation. Your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Listen. Listen. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, there is a barrier between you and God. There is a sin barrier. In the temple, in the Old Testament, in the tabernacle and in the temple, there, was, there, was, there were two places in the middle. One was called the holy place. The other place was called the holy of holies. That's where God's presence was, in the holy of holies. There was between the two a veil there was a veil. The veil was about as thick as the palm of your hand, it's believed. That veil hung between the holy place and the holy of holies. That veil represented sin because sin has created a barrier between us and God. And if, and if you don't know Christ as your Savior, then verse 2 you need to pay very close attention to on the screen. It says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. God will not even hear the prayers that you offer. Now listen to this, because your sin is still on your account, and therefore while there is sin still on your account, you cannot get into his presence. You can't even get into his presence so that he will hear your prayers, let alone get into the kingdom of God. Not even if you're religious, you take Nicodemus here in this context. He's the most religious man on the face of the earth, we'll say at that time, 
part of the Sanhedrin, a ruler of the Jews, and Jesus says to him, Nicodemus, if there is not a cleansing and if there is not a supernatural work of God, then there is no way in the world that you can enter into the kingdom of heaven. There is no way. And it's the same for us. That if you, listen, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, then there is this barrier between you and God. And I know I've used this illustration before, but I'll use it again. It'd be like me standing here and that computer being God and this pulpit being the sin that I've committed. Every sin that you commit gets piled up and it goes higher and higher and higher and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so there is a barrier between you and God. And you have been born, remember I said this, that you've been born into sin. So it starts, it starts at the beginning and it, and it begins to pile up. And that barrier gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That separation from God is referred to as spiritual death. The word in the Bible, the word death means separation. There's three kinds. There's uh, physical death. That happens when when you and I die physically, your body is separated from your spirit. There is a second death when people will be sentenced, and we'll get to this in a moment. They will be, they will be, they will stand before the judgment, the great white throne judgment, and there they will be judged for their sins, and they will be separated from God for all eternity. That's the second death. But there is a spiritual death, and that's what we are born into. Ephesians 2 1 says this, and you hath he quickened who were dead separated in trespasses and sins that's the meaning of the word dead it means separation so you are born separated from god and as you sin throughout your life all your sin piles up between you and god so now let me review that for a second we're all guilty of sin our sin has separated us from god let me go to the next one all sin must be paid for there are there are no exceptions all sin must be paid for Romans 6 23 a for the wages the word wages means payment for the wages of sin is death is separation right now if you don't know Christ you are separated from God remember he won't even hear your prayers your sins and of iniquities have separated between you and your God okay so you are separated from him if you die and those sins are still on your account, then you will be separated for all eternity, which is the second death from God. The wages of sin is death, separation. Let me go on with that. There is coming a day whenever you and I will stand before God. Okay, for me, I'll say this for me, whenever I stand before God, I will, I will stand before God. It, it's what known, what's known as the judgment seat of Christ. If you die without Christ, you will stand at the great white throne judgment. But just let me show you something on the screen. Hebrews 9, 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. You have an appointment that's coming. You probably have appointments scheduled for the new year. You might have doctor's appointments. You might have a hair appointment. You might have a dentist appointment. You, I don't know. You have appointments. It could be a lunch appointment. And you can skip those. You can, you can miss a hair appointment. Don't do it. You can skip the dentist. Uh, don't advise that either. You can skip the doctor. You can skip all of those. You can get out of them. You'll never get out of this one. You have an appointment to die and then an appointment to stand before the Creator. The one that has made you, that has formed you. You have an appointment to stand before him. When you stand before him, you will be held accountable in that day. Let me show you something. Let me just show you. Romans 2. I'm going to break it down. 2, 2 through 6, and then verse 16. Verse 2 says this, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth, against them which commit such things so okay now listen in our day and age the sometimes the justice system gets corrupted sometimes the evidence that is brought forth is is not truthful evidence in this day when you stand before god it will not be a perverted judgment 
the, the evidence that will be brought forth will be the truth against you. Every sin that you've ever committed will be brought up in that day. Let me go on. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? You think that you can escape it? It'll never happen. You will never escape it. You will never escape it. Watch this. Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness and the forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Let me tell you what that means. In your life, you and I receive the blessings from God. You have what it takes to live. You have air to breathe. You have food to eat. You have transportation. God provides these things. And ultimately, the reason he provides them because he wants you to recognize where they come from. They come from him. And the whole, the, the reason God gives them to us is his desire for us to repent and to turn to him and to recognize him and enter into a relationship with him. Verse 5. But after thy hardness and impotent, penitent heart treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So here's what happens. God gives you blessings in your life and you go through life and, and you get all the blessings. You get a family. You get, you get just multiple things, but you don't recognize God for that. Maybe you want to take the credit for it. And so towards God, your heart grows hard. What you are doing by doing that is you are treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. In other words, listen, that's all building up. And there's coming a day whenever you will stand before God. Verse 6, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Now watch verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to to my gospel. Even the secret sins of your life are going to be brought out. Let me show you where they're going to be brought out. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, John records. We're going to get into this in our study of Revelation, but it'll be a while. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and it was found no place for them. That was Christ on the throne. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. That's spiritually dead. This is this is a judgment of the unbelievers, those that rejected Christ and wanted nothing to do with him. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That Remember what I told you, the second death, that's, that's eternal separation from God. But in that day, let me tell you what's going to happen in that day. When that day comes, your body will be resurrected up out of the ground. It says, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Death refers to the grave there. The sea refers to those that were buried at sea. In that day, there'll be a resurrection of the bodies of the unsaved. It says that, that hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Hell is the holding place for your soul. If you die without Christ, your, your soul goes to hell. Your body goes in the ground or in the sea wherever you were born. But in that, or wherever you're buried, in that day, whenever your body's resurrected, it will be brought back together with your spirit and you will stand before God and you will be judged according to your works. You will be judged according to the truth that you were exposed to. You will be judged in that day for every sin that you have ever committed. So let me go back to the point again. We are all sinners. We, our sin has separated us from God. Our sin must be paid for before we die. It's got to be paid for before we die. Otherwise, you'll spend eternity separated from God. And, and, and also, there will be a day of judgment that is coming. Let me give you one more stroke of the brush, so to speak, to increase the darkness. And then I'm going to get you to the good part. We cannot save ourselves. You can't do it. You cannot erase the sin from your account. It's impossible for you to do it. 
Isaiah 64, 6 and 7 says this. But we are always an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses, all of your good works, are as filthy rags. They don't do any good, and, and we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. There is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up, him, up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us and, thou, and, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. I want you to notice the part that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You can't clean up your own life. It's impossible. It is impossible for you and I to wipe away our sin. And I've said this before, and I try to always remind people whenever I share the gospel at a funeral or wherever, that even if you cleaned up your life and you stopped sinning today and you never sinned again the rest of your life, you still would not be accepted by God. And I'm going to tell you why. Because the sin of your past has to be paid for. Every sin that you've ever committed, even if it was one, but it's more than one, it's far greater than that. If it was just one, it had to be paid for by you. Watch it, and you can't do it. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Our works are not going to do it, but people today, there are a lot of people that think that somehow, some way, they're going to work their way to heaven. They're like Nicodemus. Let me give you a list of things that people think will and are deceived into believing will get them into heaven. Some say church membership and church attendance. I've told you this before. You can take a cat and put it in a dog box for years. Put him in a dog house, and he's not going to turn into a dog. You take a sinner and run them into a church, and they can attend church for 30, 40, 50 years, and it doesn't change the nature of the individual. The church will not do it. Membership of the church will not do it. Some say, well, I'm going to keep the law. James 2.10 2, says this, that if you're going to keep the whole law, just remember that if you break one of the, one of the laws uh, of the Old Testament, you're guilty of all of them. So that's not going to work. Some people say, well, if my good outweighs the bad, well, that we know this. God doesn't have a scale, and he's not going to weigh the good and the bad. That's not going to work. Some people say, well, I pray. I read my Bible. I'm religious. That, so was Nicodemus. So was Nicodemus, and it didn't make any difference. Some people say, well, I've been baptized, and so that's going to get me into heaven. Baptism is not a requirement. Baptism is a public statement that you identify with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Some people go through a confirmation classes, and the list goes on and on. But, but the bottom line is this. Though if those things were the answer, if they were the answer, then why did God send his son? You understand what I'm saying? Why did Jesus have to come here if those were the answer? They're not the answer. And, and listen, just in case you're holding on to something, let me show you what else the Bible says in Hebrews 22. It says that almost all things by the, are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. Now, I'm going to explain what that means. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. The only way to get sin off of your account is this, by the shedding of innocent, pure blood. That's all, the whole way through the Old Testament. There are sacrifice after sacrifice. The first one occurred in the garden back in Genesis. Whenever God, you remember what Adam and Eve did after the sin? They covered themselves with fig leaves. They put these fig leaves on. You remember what Jesus, whenever he was on the earth, he cursed one thing his entire life. You know what it was? A fig tree. Because those fig leaves represent man's inability and attempt to cover his own sin. So God comes into the garden. They got the fig leaves on. God says, no, that's not sufficient. And it says that he, that he clothed them in coats of skins. Now, just so you're aware of this, in order to get the skin off, an, off of an animal to make a covering out of it, that animal's got to die. That day in the garden, that was the first bloodshed for sin. Probably lambs that day that were killed right in front, front of Adam and Eve. 
And God took the skins and he made coats of skins for them. That was an object lesson to show them that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So all these people that go around and they think that, that they're good enough to get to heaven, what they don't realize is what this verse says right here. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. There is no release from sin. So that's the dark picture. We are sinners. We are separated from God. Our sin has to be paid for. We will face God on a judgment day, and we cannot pay for our own sin. If the story ended there, we're done, we're doomed, we're finished, we don't have a hope. But it doesn't end there. That's where this comes in, the good news. That's where John 3.16 is going to come in. I'm going to break it apart. First of all, you see this. You see God's love. Let me show you the verse on the screen. And I'm going to underline and bold the parts that I want you to see. For God so loved the world. You can put your name right there. For God so loved the world... And the word so is important. It doesn't say for God loved the world. For God so loved the world. God's love for mankind, God's love for you and I is far greater than anything that we can begin to imagine. Far greater. Whenever Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he desired for them to know something about God's love. Let me show it to you. He prayed this for him, Ephesians 3, 17, 18, and 19. He said that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the, now watch this, breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that it might be filled with all the fullness, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now let me tell you what he said. He said, I pray that you will be able to understand the love of God. And he referred to the breadth of, of God's love. Listen, God's love, the breadth of God's love is so great that it reaches the entire way across the globe and around the globe to anybody that is on the face of the earth. No matter who they are, no matter what they've done, God loves them. The length of God's love reaches the sinner who is the furthest from him. The depth of God's love reaches down to the one who is the deepest in sin. And the height of God's love takes the sinner whenever he turns to Christ and sets him right up in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. That is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height of God's love. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, for God so loved you, for God so loved me, that's the love of God. Watch the next point, God's gift. Watch the verse. This is Christmas, by the way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's what I want you to see. The greatest gift that was ever given, God gave his son. Jesus Christ came into this world because we had a need. We, had this, we were separated from God because of our sin, and, and we were headed towards the judgment, and the wrath of God is building up behind us, damn. And so there, need, there had to be an answer, and we are without any kind of hope. And so we needed a Savior, and so God gave his only begotten, one of a kind, unique. That's what the word begotten means. Sinless, perfect. Some translations eliminate the word begotten. You can't take it out of there. Because he's not an ordinary son. He's a begotten son. He's the unique son of God. He's sinless and he's perfect. And he came into this world. Watch the announcement from Luke 2, 8 through 11. And there were in the same country shepherds. Shepherds. This is who's going to get the first announcement of the birth. Abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. It's in, they're in darkness. These guys, by the way, they represent every single one of us. They're in darkness. And here comes the announcement. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be. Now watch the universality of salvation to all people. Remember the breadth of God's love. It reaches around the globe. It is a love that stretches out to everybody. It is good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. But the next announcement makes it personal. 
Because the angel says this, for unto you, see that? Not unto y'all, it wasn't from West Virginia, okay? Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. See that? It's personal. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now let me go back to those shepherds. My question is this, why does he... Why the first announcement to those guys? Why not to Nicodemus and the religious leaders? Why not the rest of them? Because these guys represented every single one of us. Shepherds were despised in that day. Did you know this, that they were known for, for their stealing? Matter of fact, a, a shepherd's testimony would never be accepted in the law courts back then because they were just a corrupt group of individuals just like they represent us we were the same way sinners separated from god living in the darkness that's what we were doing that's what the shepherds they're out in the field watching over their flock by night they're out in the darkness they represent all of us the announcement was this that there was a savior that was born to them there was a, the, the news was for the entire world, but it was personal. And God wanted these guys to know, look, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. And he came, and Jesus came, and, and, and he did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, we read this. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to to the scriptures so you have God's love and you have God's gift and then you have God's offer you have God's offer watch the verse for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life the offer the offer of salvation that if you are willing to believe in him and I just got to make something very clear this isn't just a head knowledge you might be here today and say, oh, what a relief. I believe that he exists, and so I'm covered. That's not the meaning. Hold on a second. James 2.19, watch it on the screen. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But just to believe that Christ exists, existed and exists today, that's not going to get you to heaven. It's not going to get you to heaven. Satan believes that Christ exists. He talked to him. He quoted scripture to him, distorted it, but he quoted it. And he's not going to end up in heaven, and neither are you. If you think just believing in God is going to get you to heaven, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I talked to somebody not so long ago. Somebody that was battling with a, a terrible disease and sat down with them and I said to him, I said, hey, let, let me cut right to the chase if you don't mind. I said, I got to know this because I said, I care about you. I said, when and if you die, if and when, where are you going? And, and he went like this. He went, and there was, we were on the top floor of the hospital, so I knew he wasn't referring to the next floor. And I said, so you're going to heaven? And he said, yeah. And I, I said, why would God let you into heaven? Here was his answer. Because I believe in him. I said, Satan believes in God. He's not going to get to heaven. You might be sitting here today thinking that God's going to allow you entrance into heaven because you believe in him. No, 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 no. You're missing the meaning of the word. Let me back you up again. Whosoever believeth in him. The word believe means this. I want you to listen to this. It means to trust for spiritual well-being. It means to rest in. It means to rely on. In other words, what, what God's saying with this, what Jesus is saying with this verse right here is this, that right before that in verse 14, he said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up on the cross. Just like that serpent would be lifted up, Jesus would be lifted up. And, and, and he goes on and he says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then he explains that by saying that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth, who, whosoever believes that he was your substitute. 
Whosoever understands the dark picture that I painted before, that we're sinners, we're separated from God, and that we can't earn the forgiveness of sin, and you understand and you come to the end of yourself, you come to the end of yourself and you repent of your sin. You, you say, what's repent mean? It's to have a change of mind. It's to realize that the life you're living isn't acceptable by God and that you've sinned against God and that you're going in the wrong direction. And it's to have a change of mind and say, I don't want this anymore. I remember reading that a pastor said this years ago, and I believe this to be 100% accurate, that until a man comes to hate his sin or a woman comes to hate her sin, they can never understand the sacrifice of Christ. You got to hate your sin. This isn't a game. This is your eternal destiny. To believe in him is to believe that he took your place on the cross by faith to receive him as your savior and say, you know what? When somebody says to you, why are you going to heaven? Then you can say this, because Christ died as my substitute. He died in my place on the cross. He took my place. He took my position that I should have had on that cross that 2,000 years ago. And because of the work he did, I am forgiven. And receive him and put your faith in him. Watch this. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How about John 1, 10, 11, and 12? Talking of Jesus, it says he was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, there it is, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I want you to listen to what I'm going to tell you. God has placed in every single one of us a free will. You have within you the ability to choose or to reject. That's from God. He puts within your heart the law. You know whenever you sin. You know what's right. You know what's wrong. You know it because his law is written in our hearts. You have the ability to be able to choose Jesus Christ or to reject him. God's offer is this. If you are willing to receive him as your Savior and put your faith in him that he died for you on the cross, repent of your sins and accept him then we come down to the next one god's promise watch this for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that's christmas that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life god's offer is forgiveness of sin through his son jesus christ Whenever we receive him, here's what happens. Remember I told you all your sins on your account. It's, all, it's just loaded up. Your account's loaded up. When you accept Christ as your Savior, that sin is taken away, and your account is marked paid in full. Done. Finished. You are considered to be, and you are, justified. Just as if you've never sinned. That's how God views you whenever you receive Christ as your Savior. God gave the greatest gift. There's going to be a lot of gifts that are given this year, just like there are every year. But I want to tell you, there's nothing like the gift that God gave. Now listen, I want you to listen to this, and I'm going to close it out. God provided for our needs. I'm going to go back over those first couple points real quick. We're all sinners, remember? We're all sinners. Jesus became sin for us. We are separated from God. Jesus Christ built and made a way for God. Some people say this, that he built a bridge out of two pieces of wood and three nails with the cross. He built a bridge into the presence of God. God Jesus Christ has made a way for you and I to get into God's presence. Number three, all of our sin must be paid for. Jesus paid for every one of our sins. Number four, all of our sin will be judged. Jesus took our judgment on the cross. So because whenever we receive him as Savior, we never have to worry about the judgment ever anymore. Number five, we cannot save ourselves. So Jesus died to save us. Christ died on the cross to pay a debt that he did not owe because we had a debt that we could not pay. And it was a sin debt. And I don't know if you've ever received him as your Savior, but I want to just say this to you. You need to right now. 
you need to receive Christ as your Savior because just this quick, listen, your life can be done. Over. Finished. You have no idea what tomorrow holds. You don't get another chance. You don't get another chance. God, out of his love, stretched forth his hand by sending his son into the world to live here, to go to the cross, to die to pay for our sins, to be buried, to raise again, and now be seated at the right hand of the Father. He gave all of that for you. That's his love. That's his love for you. So, as I told you, he will not force it upon you. The choice is yours. By the way, back to the conversation in Nicodemus. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You say, how am I born again? By receiving Christ as your Savior. And then you are born again by the power of the Spirit of God. Remember, there's a need for a cleansing. There's a need for that supernatural work from the Spirit of God. It happens when you receive Christ as your Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the greatest gift that was ever given. The gift of your son some 2,000 years ago. When you sent him into this world, into a world of darkness, came here, was born, as we believe, in a stable, laid in a manger, a feeding trough, then lived and, and dodged many attacks against him, lived for 33 years, in the shadow of the cross, knowing that's where he was gone. But Father, he came here to be the Savior of the world, and in order to be the Savior, he had to shed his blood. Just like your word says, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, there is no forgiveness of sin. He shed his blood to pay the penalty for our sins, to pay for every single one of them. And Father, whenever we receive him, and we believe that he was our substitute, that he took our place, then we are forgiven. We then receive the greatest gift that was ever given. And we receive the greatest promise that was ever made. They shall never perish, and we shall have eternal life. Father, we thank you for that. Take the message now. Use it for your honor and for your glory. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you are not saved, Bob's going to come lead a song. I'm going to go back to my office. If you have any questions, you just follow me back. I give you that invitation every week. Uh, you follow me back, and we'll sit down and we'll talk. I'll take God's word, and we'll, I'll show you today how you can know for sure that whenever you die, you're going to heaven.